The 24th Sunday after Pentecost Gospel is Mark 12, 28 through 37. One of the experts of the law approached after he heard their discussion. When he saw that Jesus had answered them well, he asked Jesus, Which commandment is the greatest of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The expert in the law said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken correctly on the basis of the truth that he is the one, and there is no other beside him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, is more important than all those burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he responded by saying, How is it that the experts in the law say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how can he be his son? The large, large crowd listened to him with delight. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you sent the Son to be the perfect and final high priest and sacrifice that we might receive from him the forgiveness of sins and life. We pray now that as we hear his conversation with this scribe, that we will take it to heart and know that we are also called to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor. We ask in his precious name. Amen. It took just under 12 years after the posting of the 95 Thesis and the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg for Luther to finally write his catechisms. So last week we celebrated the Reformation, what we call the beginning of the Reformation, uh, that event on the evening of All Hallows, that Martin Luther challenged the scholars, the professors, uh, those who uh, studied scripture and law, to a, a debate, a conversation really. I don't know that he particularly wanted it to be a debate, but he wanted to bring into the public awareness and have a conversation about practices within the Roman medieval church, the church of his day, the church in Europe, that he disagreed with based on his understanding of what scripture taught. It started a movement that ended up in his being declared a heretic. Uh, that happened in 1521. Uh, and then shortly, ac actually after that event, uh, as he was returning home, he was kidnapped by some of his friends and taken off to hiding uh, to protect him uh, against really the burning at the stake that would happen because he'd been declared a heretic in the Roman church. When he returned from his exile to Wittenberg and his own congregation, uh, he, became, he began to be concerned about uh, what was happening in the churches around where he lived. And as he visited those congregations, uh, he came to some startling conclusions. And let me read uh, his first paragraph from the preface to his small catechism. This was published around January, February, someplace in there in 1529. 
He wrote, the deplorable, miserable condition which I discovered lately when I, too, was a visitor, has forced me and urged me to prepare this catechism, or Christian doctrine, in this small, plain, simple form. Mercy, good God, what manifold misery I beheld. The common people, especially in the villages, have no knowledge whatever of Christian doctrine. And alas, many pastors are also altogether incapable and incompetent to teach. Nevertheless, all maintain that they are Christians, have been baptized, and receive holy, the Holy Sacraments. Yet they do not understand and cannot even recite either the Lord's Prayer or the Creed or the Ten Commandments. They live like dumb brutes and irrational hogs, and yet, now that the gospel has come, they have nicely learned to abuse all liberty like experts. Our gospel today takes us to an encounter between a scribe and Jesus. And we're going to look at this conversation beginning with the scribe's questions and we'll, we'll look at what the scribe has to say and then we'll go to Jesus and his replies to the scribe's questions and conclusions. And then we're going to come back uh, and consider together with Deuteronomy chapter 6, our first lesson today, our Old Testament lesson today, uh, and recognizing that Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and tie into uh, Luther's comments about Christians, people who called themselves Christians, not being able even to recite the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, or the Commandments, and see how we might apply this conversation that Jesus and the scribe had to our lives. So let's start with the scribe's questions and his observations during this conversation. We're going to look first at the context, because as Mark relates this event to us, he says that one of the experts of the law approached after he had heard this discussion. So the expert of the law here is a, is a scribe, and, and the reason that the scribes were experts of the law is because they had heard and written over and over again God's word. That was their job. They would sit in a room uh, with the parchment or, or whatever it was they were writing on, and their quill and ink, and somebody would read to them the scriptures, and they would take that dictation and write it down. And that's how copies of the scriptures were produced. And so by hearing and writing, he had become an expert uh, in the matters of the law. And he had heard conversations that were happening be between Jesus and other religious leaders. Uh, and we find these just prior to this in chapter 12. And, and two of those uh, conversations that are probably fairly familiar for us is the conversations about taxes, when religious leaders came to Jesus asking them if they should pay taxes to Rome. Remember, Rome was the occupying force, and the Roman soldiers were enforcing the collection of taxes to go to the Roman government. And we remember in that conversation how Jesus asked them, show me a coin. And they brought a coin minted by the Roman government with the image of the Caesar. And so Jesus told the people, well, you know, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but give to God what belongs to God. And then also a conversation about the resurrection, where religious leaders, and in this case Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection after death, came to Jesus to try to trap him in this conversation about the resurrection. And we see that those conversations had the purpose of trapping Jesus, and I think that that is also the case with this one. That the expert of the law approached Jesus with this question, which commandment is the greatest of all? Now, what had transpired and happened 
in the hundreds of years in the life of the people of Israel, and, and particularly as the people of Israel came back from Babylon after the 70 year captivity, is a revival. And, and people started to study the scriptures again and, and to really consider what it is that God had called them to do. But as it is with human nature, the pendulum swang completely in the opposite direction. And instead of being content with what God had given them, they became very legalistic. And in the process of their studies, the religious leaders came up with 613 specific rules that the people of Israel were required to follow in order to prove themselves faithful Jews. And it's my suspicion that this expert of the law, this scribe, came to Jesus like the others had come, hoping for him to choose one of the 613 and then being able to argue against him. When Jesus responded, and we'll look in a minute at his response, in a way completely different than this scribe expected, his reply to Jesus was, Well said, teacher. The scribe, I think, was caught off guard. Although I don't know why, he'd been listening to all of these other conversations, and every one of them, Jesus proved his wisdom, his divine presence, and was able to answer the questions in ways that silenced his opponents. And, and really, the only reply that this scribe could have at this moment was, Well said, teacher! Acknowledging that Jesus had chosen wisely his reply, not picking just one of the 613 that would be the greatest, but really finding the summary and the statement from Scripture itself, two statements from Scripture itself, and we'll look at those in a minute, about the greatest commandments. And then that scribe summarized to Jesus what Jesus had replied. And he understood that to love, that is to love God, and to love our neighbor is better than whole burnt offering and sacrifices. That all the things that, we, that they did, or as we apply this to us, that we might do, is nothing. If we do not love God, or love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So then let's look at Jesus' reply to the scribe's question, and his conclusion about the scribe himself. What is the greatest commandment? Jesus' first reply was, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 4, with the here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So he's establishing the basis for the greatest commandment. And then the greatest commandment is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And here the word love is to offer yourself sacrificially to the Lord your God. To offer yourself sacrificially with everything that is you. Your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. So Jesus then went directly to scripture. Went to this very important and particular passage from Deuteronomy. As Moses is preparing to send the people into the land of Israel, he is reminding them of everything that the Lord has proclaimed to them as the framework for their fellowship with God. And central at that framework 
apart from any specific rule that might have been spoken or that might have been pulled out of the commandments, is this one, that we are called to sacrifice ourselves, to put aside our own ways, our own desires for the Lord. Jesus didn't stop there, though. He also brought a second commandment, and we'll find this one in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. So again, he goes to the scriptures that this expert in the law would have clearly known, probably had memorized. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And again here, the word love, as Jesus quotes it, is that you sacrifice yourself for your neighbor. That you consider your neighbor more important than yourself in your dealings with your neighbor. And when the scribe then heard Jesus affirm these scriptures and set them above all the other commandments, the scribe recognized that Jesus had spoken well. And then Jesus replied to the scribe, You are not far from the kingdom of God. That his understanding was right. That all the things that we might do count for nothing if they are not done in our sacrificial giving to God. That all the things that we might do are nothing if they are not done in our sacrificial giving for each other. And a recognition that that can be possible for us only because of what God does for us in the forgiveness of sins and the bringing into life. As we read in our second lesson from Hebrews, that Jesus is the holy and perfect sacrifice and high priest. And that through his sacrifice on the cross, he brings to us forgiveness and life. So then how do we take this conversation between Jesus and this expert in the law and apply it to us? And I think the key to the application is again going to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear the rest of Deuteronomy chapter 6. After the command itself to love the Lord your God. And what Moses reminded the people, we'll find these in verses 6, seven, six and 7. These words that I am commanding you today are, are, are to be on your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. And speak about them when you sit in your house, and you, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So the command then is not just to love the Lord your God, but to live that out. Having experienced God's love and forgiveness, then our love for God flows out in that we share what God has given us. And we find that the primary place for that sharing is in the home. And if we go back again to Martin Luther's writing of the small catechism, he did it specifically so that parents would have a tool to use with their children. The large catechism was done for the pastors so that the pastors would have the tools to share with their congregations. But the small catechism was done for the parents, so that they would share that with their children, because that is the place that God has designed for faith to be promoted, for faith to be shared, for faith to be taught. And I would challenge us then, to take this tool, and we have a variety of tools, and you will find that we uh, can read scripture, 
And we can look at a variety of different scripture plans. I use a particular plan that I have created for myself that begins on the first Sunday of Advent and then reads through the church year where I read about three chapters of scripture a day and then a psalm added to that takes no more than 15 minutes of my day to be daily in scripture, reading and letting the Holy Spirit work his word in me and continue to give me faith through that hearing of the word. But I also suggest that we have this tool in our tradition called the small catechism. And that the core of the catechism is the law, the gospel, and the Christian life. And I would challenge us to take our catechisms and use them in our daily time with our families. And we'll notice, if we go back to Deuteronomy 6, that there are four occasions in every day when God is asking us to share with our families what He has commanded us. When you sit in your house, and, and I believe that that's as you sit down and, and your meals together. When you walk on the road, now this is a little bit different culturally, because this would mean, uh, remember that, this, that the societies of Israel were, were community-based. They were village and city-based. And people lived in the villages or the cities, the towns, and then they would walk out every day to their farms. And the dads would take the children out into the farm to work. And it, the idea was that as you walk from your home out to work, that you're sharing God's word with your children. And, I, and, I, and we need to find how that applies to us in our lives today. But certainly as we are traveling as we're spending time with our children, whatever it is we're doing in leisure or play or shopping, whatever it is, that we're taking opportunity to speak God's word to our children. And then two other occasions, when you put your kids to bed and when you get them up in the morning and God has given us his word to read together and he has given us through his servant Martin Luther an explanation of the Ten Commandments, an explanation of the Apostles' Creed, an explanation of the Lord's Prayer, an explanation of our sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. And I would recommend and ask us to a new commitment that as we live out our lives together, whether it's our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, or just our spouses, and many of us are in a situation where we're living alone or we're living without our children around us anymore. But that we take the time to be reminded and to refresh for us and even take our catechism and read a portion of it each day as we're spending time together remembering what is the greatest commandment. The conclusion that the expert of the law came to was that Jesus spoke well. And we do well also to hear the words of Jesus, that we love the Lord our God with everything that we are, that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and that remembering the context of those commands, we teach them diligently to our children. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you for sending Jesus, the perfect and final high priest and sacrifice, who gave his life that we might have the forgiveness of sins and life, that we might experience your love for us, that we might be born again, that the old nature would be put to death, and in its place, a new nature rise, a new nature that loves you and desires to give you everything, that puts the neighbor first in life. So help us to live in this life and in a practical way to, to be in your word daily and to share your word daily with those around us because it is in your word where life is spoken to us.
We ask this in Jesus' precious name.